uh, now I, I have the pleasure of uh, turning it over to a colleague and friend and advisor of the consortium, uh, Dr. Kelly Doran. Uh, many people know Dr. Doran. She's the assistant professor in the departments of emergency medicine and population health director of the health and housing lab within the Department of uh, Population Health at NYU School of Medicine. Wow, that's a long, long set of titles there, Dr. Doran, but uh, thank you for joining us and uh, I'll turn it over to you for some closing remarks. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for the introduction, Jim. And um, I have I'm happy to be here. I've been a fan of the consortium for a really long time. I think that this work is critically important and I look forward to the annual convening each year and this year didn't disappoint. And I'm just you know, thinking through some of the highlights uh, that we've heard over the past few days. Yesterday's first session, we heard uh, essential yet undervalued addressing the workforce crisis facing the health and human services sector, I think relevant to some of the conversations we just heard in the last panel. And this one was really eye opening to me, just highlighting the big crisis that's only worsened since COVID around this workforce shortage. And of course, that's going to trickle down to the services that the clients receive because the people can really only do so much in the end and can only be stretched so thin. And it really just highlighted the need for government contracts and more generally just valuing this work as a society more. And this work, particularly the work we heard of social workers is disproportionately performed by women, by people of color. And that probably has something to do with why they're paid so little. Um, but also as we, as, as we think about things, we, we need to pay people uh, better. We can't have our social workers essentially making poverty level wages in New York. The second session, uh, coordinating systems to improve support for homeless New Yorkers experiencing mental health crises. This one to me was just really a, a fantastic model of what the Health and Housing Consortium does so well, pulling people together from homeless service organizations, hospitals, people with lived experience, and together talking, you could even see people's wheels turning as people recognize maybe problems that they hadn't recognized before and talk through these challenges and possible solutions together. And then day two today started with that keynote address from Mr. Daryl McGraw, uh, somebody with lived experience and expertise in urban trauma, addiction recovery and community reintegration. And I have to say, I mean, that session was just like a full, a full education. If you weren't there, you have to go watch it. I honestly, I feel like I should have had to pay an admission fee to watch, watch that session. It was so good. But uh, Mr. McGraw reminded us, uh, for example, that, that a home is about more than the housing. We need the housing, but to push us to think about community, belonging, self-fulfillment. And then one of the quotes from that keynote that I really loved personally was when he was talking about how we kind of are all trying to move towards evidence-based practice. And he said, ask me, <laughs> like I'm the best evidence-based practice you've got right here. Just ask me, I'm trying to tell you. And then the session that immediately followed, close Rikers, then what? Ensuring appropriate health care and housing for individuals leaving incarceration. I think we all know um, about this crisis. And you know, the, the panel really highlighted some of the gaps and some of the barriers as people are leaving incarceration, things like an ID, a phone, Obviously housing is a huge one. And then uh, even, even things like Jerome Green pointed out the foundational importance of establishing trust with people. And I thought that that was really meaningful too. And then finally, you all just heard the, the session four, New York's Medicaid 1115 waiver concept paper with Brett Friedman, really important information for all of us and hearing a little bit about how New York's working to deliver on the promise of Medicaid you know, to be clear, I don't think anyone believes that the answer to our homelessness and housing crisis in our state or our country sits primarily within the healthcare system, but there are certainly really important roles for healthcare to contribute and to collaborate, which again, highlights the importance of the work that the Health and Housing Consortium is doing. So this is the, the moment in the event where we would kind of take a moment to give a round of applause to the Health and Housing Consortium. We're virtual, so you'll just, you know, take a second and, and clap to yourselves in your seats, but I also wanted to express appreciation to all of the event attendees and to say that the work that all of you do is really important. It's been a hard year. It's been a hard two years, really. I certainly know it. 
Uh, many of us in both the housing and the healthcare sectors are tired, exhausted really. Uh, some of us have seen people struggle during this pandemic in ways that are going to haunt us for our whole lives. Uh, and despite seeing some positives recently, like fewer families entering shelters when we had eviction moratoria in place, we're also witnessing a visible increase in adult homelessness and the suffering that comes from it. Uh, as you know, I work in the emergency department and our emergency departments are like barometers of what's happening around us. And we're seeing it in the emergency department. We're seeing the people who fall through the cracks. We're seeing people who have multiple medical problems and are living unsheltered because the existing options are not good options for them. We're seeing people who are becoming newly homeless and are coming to us in their 60s, 70s, 80s, homeless for the first time. We're seeing more overdose and we have an increasing overdose crisis in our city that's disproportionately affecting people experiencing homelessness. And recently I've been up at night thinking about the patients that we lost, people that were brought to us by EMS from the streets who our teams tried hard to resuscitate, but couldn't. And we still have many, many people experiencing homelessness dying each year in New York. So all of that said, I'm glad that we're here together today. It has been hard, but most of us are gonna keep on fighting the good fight and working for a better tomorrow because that's what we do. And I do think we have reasons to be hopeful too. We have a new administration coming in New York City and the energy that comes along with that, hopefully for positive change. We have a very supportive federal administration right now and new federal investments on the horizon. Importantly, I think we've seen the increasing recognition of how important it is to listen to people with lived experience, to value those voices and to listen to people. And we've seen an increasing recognition of the racial inequities in both housing and health and an increasing recognition of structural racism as the common root driver here and an acknowledgement that we need to confront that directly. And last, we have seen more and more widespread acceptance of this intersection of housing and health. When I think back to uh, the first consortium convening I, I had the opportunity to speak at was many years ago now, maybe seven years ago, something like that. And just we've come a whole world um, in terms of how much people accept this concept that people's housing and their health are related. So I'll just end by saying again, thank you, Bonnie, Amy, Harmony, Tess, everybody involved in this fantastic event and for all of the work you do with the Health and Housing Consortium. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, and uh, before I do anything else, and, and please, before you leave, I, I just really have to thank our team at the Bronx and Brooklyn Consortia. Um, you've seen Amy Freeman, um, but two of the most important people for pulling off this event are Harmony Arcilla and Tess Summer, our project coordinators for the Brooklyn and Bronx Consortia, respectively. Um, this event has gone off without a hitch, and that's um, entirely because of them. Uh, across these two days, we've had a total of 22 speakers from government, hospitals, supportive housing, homeless services, and more. We've had executives, clinicians, frontline workers, and people with lived experience of homelessness and incarceration. I want to thank each of them for sharing their time and expertise with us. Um, and thank you so much, Kelly, for summing up um, our some highlights from our annual convening, um, and especially for giving us um, some things to feel hopeful about. Um, we discussed some really challenging issues over these past two days and significant barriers, um, but as always, the work continues. And um, if there's anything we've seen in this pandemic, it's not just that we are resilient, um, but I think it's that we're no longer going to accept the bare minimum. So I hope that you all leave here feeling more empowered. I can promise the consortium is going to continue these conversations in 2022 and find ways to advance some of the recommendations that have been made. Um, specifically on this uh, session, uh, we'd love to help organize your comments and feedback on the 1115 waiver concept paper um, for those when those public comment periods come. Um, so more to come. Um, please stay connected with us. Thank you all so much for joining and sharing comments and resources throughout the convening. Um, we'll be sending out session recordings and materials in the coming days. Um, I think if you can provide some more feedback, if you have anything you want to share with us, um, let us know what else we could be working on that would be helpful. You can do so in the form that was just dropped in the chat. Um, thank you so much. Have a great evening. <laughs>